We're going to read the first five verses. Father, bless these words. Bless this message. Anoint us to hear, to receive. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. God bless this message. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelations chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll. Or to look at it. So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll. Or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold. Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Please be seated. So, I'm using my laptop today, so hopefully it doesn't blink out on me. Right. Father, just keep the power working on this baby. All right. So, 27 times in the book of Revelations, we see the Lord Jesus Christ. He's depicted as the glorified Lamb. Beautiful. In Revelation 17:14. And in Revelation 19, 16, he's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he says, I want, to, I want you to see that I am still the Lamb, this precious Lamb. He is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The wounds in his hands, the wounds in his feet, his side where they thrust the spear up, and his brow where they put the thorns are visible for all eternity. As a matter of fact, when Thomas, doubting Thomas, the first Sunday, first church service wasn't there. And then he says, I'm not going to believe it until I see it, until I see him myself. And the second Sunday, he made church and Jesus appeared and he had to put his fingers inside the wounds. So those wounds, we will see them. We will see those precious wounds in all eternity. All right. So the father was there and in Revelation, the verses that we read, the father was there with the title deed to the earth. So what happened? The earth was created for, for Adam and Eve, was created for us. And because they fell, they gave the title deed over to, to the devil for a season. But here we see here, it says, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Where is there a man who is worthy to take back the title deed to the earth that held Adam's soul? Question, right? And John wept. I can imagine when he, John the Baptist, that God gave him this revelation. He's, he's in heaven and he heard these things and he just started crying. He wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book. This, by the way, is the only time in the book of Revelation Jesus is called a lion. The lion there is called, he's, the lamb there is called a lion because of his victory over the demons, shaming them publicly when he ascended them into heaven in Colossians 2, 15 and 16. So listen carefully about the, the history here. So one day there will come the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will simply speak the word to the end, the most devastating war the world has ever seen. That will mark the end of every religious battle and reign of the Antichrist and his system. This world right now doesn't realize we're heading to Armageddon. There will be a battle. It all revolves around Jerusalem. I mean, you hear history, you hear the, the, the news. You know what? The news is not telling you the truth. All right? Who's the king of the power of the air? It's the devil. And guess who rules the, the media? It's the devil. 
But you have got this precious book called the Bible. And you have you have good teachers. There's a lot of good information out there. When we're covering, when we're going to have class next week. We will have class next week. Class number five, okay? And uh, it, it, it's an amazing thing. So there's going to be this battle called Armageddon. That will mark the end of every religious battle in the reign of Antichrist and assistance. So after all of this, the word of God tells us that in heaven, there will be a new song. Like the songs we sang today, we, we sang a new one today. But in heaven, there will be a new song. Uh, I lost my place here. All right. This new song is called the lamb that was it's called the, the song that talks about the lamb that was slain. Jesus wants us to know that in heaven he is the lamb that was slain, but is not glorified. That's his position. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting, and he's being patient. We will have no problem recognizing the lamb. Why? It says he's, he's surrounded by four six-winged seraphim. That's the, the biggest, strongest angel that you can think about, okay? Four and twenty elders and a host of angels that will surround him and worship him who is worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, blessing, and glory. You know, we're going to be worshiping God for all eternity. We do it here for moments for it seems like just a few minutes. But you're going to be worshiping God and you're going to want to. It's not going to be an effort. It's going to be a love thing. You're going to love to worship him. It says here that they're going to worship him. They're worshiping him for all eternity. Thousands <laughs> upon thousands will worship him who is worthy. And who are they honoring? The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Right? In Revelation 21, 14, it says there are 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem. So everything that we have, this building is a foundation. My house, where you live, is a foundation. But the new Jerusalem, the new, is going to have 12 foundations. It says here it has uh, 12 foundations of the new Jerusalem representing the 12 apostles who was the heads and who is the head of the apostles It's the Lamb of God okay Revelations 21 9 as the born-again members of his church and that's you and I by the way we are the Lamb's wife we're, we're heading towards a wedding here in a couple of months uh, probably in a month okay but we as the church is the bride of Christ for all eternity. But at a certain event called the white throne judgment, he opens the Lamb's book of life. And those whose names are not recorded in it will be cast into hell. But those who are saved by the blood of the Lamb, there will be eternal rejoicing in a city with streets of gold. There will be no temple there. All right, because Jesus is the center. He's going to be the light that supplies the light for all eternity. And the city had no need of the sun. In Revelation 21 23, it says, The city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did it light. And the Lamb is what is the light thereof. So it's going to be eternally light. The Lamb that was slain, the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes away the sins of the world in Isaiah 53 7 John 1 29 is that same land and he's glorified in heaven you know he sits at the right he sits at the right hand of the father and he's it says that he's praying for you and for me day and night day and night he doesn't sleep but he's praying for us and who will we face at the Bema seat the evaluation that we're going to face as, as Christians we're going to face the lamb it will be the lamb passes judgment upon us and deter right, determines our rewards I, I want you to understand this that you know we our church is called greater grace but everything that we know that accumulate that accumulates in history is, is going to be surrounds the word grace and has everything to do with the word grace that song that we sang was beautiful and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse in Malachi 4 6. So that's that's the curse in the Old Testament. But here comes the New Testament. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. In Revelations 22 20. That's the end. 
that last verse that we read was at the end of the Old Testament and Revelation 22, 21 talks about the grace of God. So Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, ends with the threat of a curse, but God's final um, these gadgets. All right. That's why I like paper. You know what I mean? Um, let me find this again. All right. But God's final word in Revelation is grace. Be with you all. He is the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5.10. His grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust in Titus 2.12. And we can't do that by ourselves. We have no power to overcome the lust of this world. We have to trust God for that and ask him for help. We're not bound by a system of works or a program of condemnation. But we try to work our way up to God's approval. A lot of people that I know feel like they have to, they're on this good boy system. They feel they have to work their way and earn their way into heaven. And that's not what God's grace and God pays for the sins of the world is all about. All right? If that were the case, we would all go to hell. Think about that. But grace is at work in me and he's at work in you. And it teaches us to what? To put the Lord Jesus Christ first. And to make no provision for the flesh. In Romans 13, 14. This is the work of grace. Grace to break cycles of sin. You know, we are all caught up, if we're not careful, in cycles of sin. And the only way to break those cycles is according to the word of God. you got to find a promises that God gives us. Claim those promises. You know, and ask God to help you, to, get, to show you the way into those promises, to deliver you from those cycles of sin. We all have cycles of sin, believe it or not. We're all vulnerable to those things. And only God can break those cycles. We have to ask him for that help. So when I walk in the spirit in Galatians 5, 16, I do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I'm thinking with God and asking God for help, that's when my mind, that's where my heart is. And I'm not caught up in that cycle. Instead, I make a decision to put on Jesus Christ. I choose to walk in the spirit. That takes care of every other thing that I might otherwise be tempted to do. But that's, see, it's a choice. We have to decide to think with God. You know, it's not just something you do once in a while. You have to be thinking with him. You have to, you have to have conversations with him. You have to interact with him. And that's where that relationship comes in. And that's where that power comes in in God. All right. First, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't do any good. Secondly, I'm never going to fulfill such a thought. And thirdly, it would only bring guilt. Talking about thinking that I could let the world help me to come out of a cycle of sin. It just won't work. All right. Why? Because in 1 Timothy 5.22, it says, keep thyself pure. 1 Corinthians 3, regarding the beam of sea. The Bible tells us this, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. In verse 16, by grace we have been what? Made temples of God. These bodies are, are temples of God. You know, we do the best we can to not abuse those temples. You know what I mean? Be careful what we eat, what we drink, right? We're joined to him by the one Spirit, so know ye not that he which is joined in the harlot in one body, for two said he shall be what be one flesh in First Corinthians six sixteen. Paul meant this. This is what Paul meant. Fornication is a sin inside the body, and that is why people who do it have such difficulty getting out of it. Sins outside the body are bad enough, but fornication affects the libido which is a part of the central nervous system, actual physical response patterns are established in the chemistry of the human body. You know, in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, 1, it talks about not to touch one another before marriage, and that's important. See, God created a human body. It's a beautiful thing. So if you keep yourself, if you keep yourself for each other, 
until marriage, what happens is those libido waves are not come for each other because they're going to happen. Chemistry happens, you know, so you have to be careful with this. So it goes on, it says, the chemistry of the human body, and it's, it's sent through the bloodstream, it's stimulated because of choices. Just as liquor and drugs go into the bloodstream and affect the whole body, so do the effects of lust, anger, and fornication. Fornication, the Bible says, destroys souls. It can ruin compatibility in marriage, either by making one cold and unresponsive or by causing the other to be what? Have a, an insatiable sex drive because of the response patterns established through a history of premarital sex. Now don't get condemned by what I'm like, trying to give you the word of God in this, okay? This is important. Thankfully, God can break the cycle in an instant when we simply confess to him. I can have anything from you, you died for me. Now this is a conversation that you have with God when you're trying to break these cycles. You're honest with him. You tell him that you're powerless in these areas and you're asking him for help. You died for me, you were buried, and now you live inside of me. Whatever I've done in my past has been done away with. I accept my place with you, and I'm not going to what to leave. God says, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. He says, I'm not going to leave you alone on the cross. <clears throat> That's why God says to carry your cross daily. Why? Because you're identifying with who he was and what he did for us. So I'm crucified and I'm buried in the life I now live. I live in the resurrection life of God in Romans 6.13. So now I accept that there is no condemnation despite all my problems in the past. I won't live in guilt because what the blood of the Lamb has taken care of it. The beauty about God's grace is this. It's not a license to sin, but it's not a condemning word. All of us fall short of the glory of God, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm no better than you and you're no better than me. We all have that ability to sin. But God says we can come out of it. We can come out of it by the grace of God. Leviticus 23, 17 and 18, it says the loaves of bread that were baked for an offering had leaven in them. So a little bit of leaven in the bread. Yet they were first fruits unto the Lord. God knows there is leaven in us, referring to the old sin nature, but he still uses us. Can you imagine that? In spite of who we are, God says, I'm going to use you, Paul. I'm going to use you, Lindsay and Trevor. And I mean, come on. Think about that. God will use you and he'll use me to represent who he is. I mean, we know how, how far we fall short. If we're honest with each other and, and you know as we reflect back our point we don't condemn ourselves because god doesn't want that we're brought back out because of the grace and mercy of god listen to this in first corinthians 15 1 to 31 it says i died with him I, I take up my cross today it's a moment by moment walk with him in isaiah 27 3. the truth that has made you free in john 8 20, 8 32 excuse me the Son has made me free indeed in John 8, 36. This is not only for the past, but for today. What I did yesterday, the things that I experienced yesterday, and I shared some of that with you at the beginning of the, of the service here. There were so many things that happened, and I had to ask God to help me not to be judgmental towards the things that I saw. It's so easy. It's so easy. But there go I, except by the grace of God. And that's what I love about God's grace. All right. So it says here now, then he said that un unfruitful branches are cast into the fire, which speaks of my works being burnt up, and being walked over by men when we fail to produce fruit by God as a living power of grace. I want you to think about this. All the things that you're going to represent or present to God at the beam of seat are the things that you did but what you heard, you heard some bit of truth and the Holy Spirit said, OK, stir it up your heart. And you say, God, help me to, to do that. Help me to have a pure heart towards people. Help me to be forgiving. Help me to to show mercy. And those things, because of God's power in you, 
giving you the ability to do that towards people that God has put in your lives. That kind of action, that kind of uh, love that pours through you because God is in you, those are the things that you're going to gain rewards from. When nobody can forgive, God gives you the ability to forgive somebody. Think about that. You know? It's so easy to hold on to something and be and, and causes bitterness in our lives. We just we don't want to let it go. We identify it with it. It becomes who we are. The bitterness becomes who we are. God says, "Give it up." When God helps you and delivers you from that, that's something that you can offer to God because He gave you the ability to do it. We can't even take credit for that. How about this, I am what I am by grace. I can have whatever I want from God because all things are mine. Did you hear that? I am Christ and Christ is God. In 1 Corinthians 3.23. He is able to do exceedingly above all I ask or think in Ephesians 3.20. As much as I think that I want to do for somebody else, God can help you to do even better. And to, and to give even more and to forgive even more. To show, I mean, it's amazing. An amazing cycle. He supplies all of our needs. Philippians 4.19. Did you hear that? How many needs? All our needs. It's not always money. It's not always a job. It's all your needs. Sometimes you just need peace. Sometimes you just want a good night's sleep. Okay? I mean, just simple things like that. You know, he supplies the healing in your joints when you're, you're sore. He, you know, he delivers you. He covers you. He protects you. He provides all your needs. He's able to make grace abound towards me and towards you so that we will have all that we need for everything that we face in 2 Corinthians 9 8. You hear that? That's somebody who has your back today. God has your back. He is, he is light years ahead of what you think you need. He's the ultimate chess player. He knows all the moves. But what do you do? You, you realize that when you're weak, he's strong. And when you can't do it, when things are impossible with men, all things are possible with God, and no matter what area of life that you're going through. All right? So wrapped in this package is the possibility of spirituality, stability, and maturity in 1 Peter 5.12. So what does God say? He wants us to maintain certain disciplines in our walk with Christ. But the Holy Spirit brings spiritual provisions for the process of grace. Only the Holy Spirit can give you the effects of joy and peace. I mean, it's in you. He's living in you. He can produce it through you and, and have it come out of you. You can't produce joy. People say, I'm the happiest person. But you know what? That's, that's self. Joy is not, a, it's a gift from God. You understand that? Only God can produce that in you. It far outweighs happiness. Because a person could be going through complete persecution, but yet have joy in his life. Because God produces that joy. And people see that in them. You know, they, they watch somebody going through a great trial and say, how can you be so happy? Or how can you... Why? Because they're not depending on themselves, they're depending on God in them. And they trust Him for the outcome. Whether it's good or bad by sight, they trust God. And there comes that joy. Nothing, if you have that, then nothing can cause any kind of intimidation. The world can intimidate you. Fear cannot intimidate you. All right? There's no indictments, no weapon formed against me that can prosper. I want you to think about how people can, can take a situation in your life or in my life and they can make it a, lit a literal living hell. Because they know things about you, they think they see, they've seen things in your life and they want, they want you to go through the mill, the grind mill, you know what I mean? And they produce things in your life and, but you know, we need to understand that God's on the throne. He's above that mess. And in Ephesians 2.8, we're seated with him above that. Even though we, you know, people are trying to get us through it. You know, just think of the three Hebrew boys. Yeah, they were in that furnace, but who was in there with them? Jesus Christ was in there with them. They didn't even feel the heat. 
It even gets cinched. So my thought life is an area that God wants me to keep in check. I need to be aware of projections and make sure that they don't become my feelings through provisions and vain imaginations. We have to be so careful, so careful what we think we see and we form opinions and we, we start to be judgmental and critical towards people. When God says don't judge by sight, don't even judge by what you hear because you don't know the hearts of the people that you're looking at or the, or the hearts of the people that you're listening things from. You know, we have to we have to let God be who God is in people's lives. And just keep our hearts in check and pure before God, right? My part is to recognize temptation because of the things I experienced in Adam. I must discern impressions that come from the satanic kingdom. You know, the devil does come against me. You know, who's the guy that used to say the devil made me do it? Flip Wilson? Yeah. yeah, right. Well, that's not always true. But I guarantee you the devil is trying to make havoc of your life. He's paying attention to who you are and how you walk with God. So pay attention to God, all right? So I must discern impressions that come from the satanic kingdom. Also, I've got to understand that receiving the wrong impressions can lead to oppression. Listen carefully. Oppression, all right, that leads to depression. It causes me to condemn myself in negative reactions. If I'm not careful how I think about people, all right, there's the oppression, all right? That oppression gets me negative, it gets me depressed. Now everything is negative. I, I, I catch myself in negative cycles about people that I'm around, things that I'm going through, things that God has put in my life so, so that I need to learn how to trust who God is. So we have to be careful, all right? But whenever negativity or lustful projections come, I can boldly say I am what I am by the grace of God in 1 Corinthians 15 10. I want you to understand how important that verse is. All right? No matter how bad you fail, and I you will fail. All right, and God says, I am who I am. Paul said this, I am a complete failure in things. In in, in Romans 7, he says, I do the things I shouldn't do, and I don't do the things I, I know I should do. You understand that? So he has a conflict in his flesh. But then he says there's no condemnation in Romans 8 1, but he says, I am who I am by the grace of God. Isn't that amazing? At the beam of seat, my life will be evaluated by that revelation. What did I do with what God showed me? What did I do with what God gave me? We need to just respond. Respond in love to God and just to surrender who we are to God. Our lives should reveal God's nature, whether by words or by actions. Right? If we're rebellious, self-righteous, we're arrogant, all right, and, and people have forgotten 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where their problems started when what? They began to live by the letter of the law instead of by the spirit of the truth. You know? Have you ever been around somebody that they, you know, they're right. <laughs> you know they're right, and they let you know they're right. Yeah. That's the letter of the law, you know. But you can be right. We, we can think about your lives and your testimony towards other people. You know the truth about salvation. You know the truth about who Christ is. How do you communicate that to people around you? You take a Bible and say, hey, pay attention. Sit down. I've got to talk to you. No. The Holy Spirit opens up a door, opens up a conversation, allows you to live your life. So they can see that you are a sinner saved by grace. You'll make mistakes, but that your life somehow supernaturally reveals Christ to them. And they ask you about it. You know, none of us are perfect. None of us have perfect days every day. It doesn't work that way. You know? We're real people. We're real human beings that, that have problems. But we have a, what, solution to the problem, and that's Jesus Christ and his grace and mercy towards us. That's what keeps us. That's what keeps us going. If we didn't have that, we'd be so condemned and so guilty, we wouldn't even want to get out of bed in the morning. I don't want to get up. You know? 
But God has a plan every single day, doesn't he? Whether it's to come to church, thank you for coming. Or to go to work so you can pay the bills, you know. He has a plan. All right. We do not live under law, but by the living word and the grace of Almighty God. We become living epistles. Our lives, as we store God's word in our heart, become living epistles. You know, when a person opens up a book and starts to read the book, it starts to understand the story, right? So now we've opened up the book, the Bible, right? We've stored those words and those those doctrines in our heart, now our lives become a what? A living epistle. So now we can communicate that truth to our lives, the way we live our lives, and what we say. And communicate to people around us. Our lives write things on the heart, things on the heart of men, even when we cannot speak the word to them. Yeah, think about that. What if you didn't have a tongue? What if you, you couldn't talk? Could you still communicate God to people? They would look at you, maybe the way you do your work, maybe the way you treat them, you're kind to them, you respond to them. So your life is now a testimony, right? Without ever speaking a word. All right, so. <clears throat> when we go through the valley of weeping in Psalm 84, six and seven, we can leave behind fresh pools of water. I love this. Listen to this carefully, please. That way the next person who goes through such a valley has fresh water to drink because we have been through it. We go from strength to strength and appear before God in Zion. Where is our strength made perfect? Good question. In weakness in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. The grace of God is sufficient in our weakness. And God's weakness is stronger than the strength of men in 1 Corinthians 1.25. Thank God for the judgment of grace. I want you to understand that. So when it was talking about, you know, these pools of water that we form. So we're, we go through something. God allows us to go through a, a, a hardship. You know, maybe a personal tragedy. But in that experience in that in that process we create pools of water so that God puts people in our lives that are now facing the same things you did but there's the pools of water they can drink out of you know you can relate to them because you've gone through it you, you can be a good listener because you've been through it and God's helped you to go through it isn't that, isn't that awesome all right I just want to close with this And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespass and sin, where in time past he walked according to the course of this world. You know, you were in the world before, but you're not in the world anymore. According to the prince of the power of the air, the devil had control of your life. You didn't even understand it, but he did. He kept you away. He kept you away from even maybe even hearing about who God was. All right. So the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Here he's describing who we used to be, maybe what we were involved with, or maybe what we were doing. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and we're seated, seated above with him. That in the ages to come he might what, show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in him. Walk in them. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10. Write those verses down. Read that portion again. 
and realize what God has taken us out of and what he's given us and what we can look forward to. Past, present, and future. It's an amazing thing. I want to conclude this message with that we should what, walk in them. This is a unique, it's a grammar structure in the Greek that means that my walk is not expected to be straight line. Listen carefully to this, this definition. Right? Rather, it's better represented by dotted lines. In other words, God is, God's grace has provided a covering for my failures. A straight line would indicate no spare, no space for failure. But when I fall, rebound by grace, yes, there is leaven in me. All of us have the propensity for sin, right? Leaven. But I can come to my Heavenly Father in any situation and find grace to help in my times of need. You understand what that's saying? So the dotted line shows that when I fell, that, that space, God picked me back up and got me back on the track. I fell again. He picked me up, got me back on the tracks. Our life is like that. And that's grace. So when I accept that God's judgment for every believer is perfect judgment of grace, then I will what? Be motivated to live purely. When God gives me more grace, I what? I want to sin less, not sin more. Why? Because I understand how precious, I mean, just to be forgiven by God. To understand that he doesn't hold it against me. He doesn't even remember it. We remember the faults of others. God does it. He wants us to be like him, to forget them, to forgive and to forget. It's difficult. It's not easy. But God can give us the ability not to not to dwell in it, not to remember it, and not to have it become who we are and identify with. But identify with mercy and grace, because that's who he is. So the Bema Seed experience can be what? An unbelievably joyous one. We have been called to be stewards of his amazing grace. And by that grace, we will bear much fruit. His grace will add to our account immeasurable rewards, and blessings for us to enjoy for all eternity. All the things that we earn according to his grace, you know, we can, we're gonna put it at his feet. It's gonna be an amazing thing, you know? Think about Christmas, you know? How many kids go through Christmas tree looking for presents, you know? In our house, with all the grandkids, they have piles, you know, this is for him, this is for her, you know what I mean? I mean, just think about that Christmas tree, think about Jesus' feet, and you're going to just give him all those things that, that you earned and he gave you by grace and mercy. All right? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you've done, and God, that... You are the precious Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. God, help us to just meditate and, and just realize how precious that is. That because you finished the work in John 19, 30, it's, it's, it's it. There's nothing more that can be done. All we have to do is receive your salvation by grace. Receive Christ today. Understand that you can't do anything except just receive that free gift. He's paid for all the sins of the world. They've already been bought and paid for on that cross. But the issue, the issue is in sin. Let's receive the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. So receive Christ today. We ask that you stay. Amen. Amen.